The metaverse usually refers to a three-dimensional immersive environment and the web 3.0 is an evolution, as usually seen as an evolution of the web towards a more interactive, generative AI and decentralized immersive environment. So let's talk about these concepts a little bit to see where the interface, what, the, what are the visions, where's the interface of the digital age going. Well, the general idea that is very convincing and has been a long time in the making is basically the notion that we have to get more to a three-dimensional reality in the digital age because our visual perception has been trained for 375 million years, almost 400 million years to perceive depth and to perceive three-dimensional realities. Only for the last 500 years since the printing press have we looked at two-dimensional screens, let's say. We looked at books, we look at screens, and that's just a waste of our potential. We don't really feel immersed. Also, the idea to make it much more tactile, for example, and immerse ourselves, take advantage of, of our entire interface, not only of, of a very small part of it. And this idea has been long in the making and still is facing a lot of technological difficulties. So the main problems here have been for a long time, not that we don't have the vision and we don't understand the argument that it makes sense to have a three-dimensional immersive environment. The idea is that the problem is the technological challenges of the computational power and the bandwidth that even in the richest part of this world, we don't have enough. But the idea has been long in the making. So Neuromancer from William Gibson in the 1980s already you know, played around with these ideas. He coined the phrase, the matrix, which was later adapted to a movie series, uh, The Matrix Universe, and Cyberspace, which he defined as a consensual hallucination experienced daily by billions of legitimate operators in every nation, a graphic representation of data. Lines of light ranged in the non-space of the mind, clusters and constellations of data. So yes, hanging out and let's call it the metaverse, you call it the cyberspace or the matrix, all similar terms. The term metaverse comes from another science fiction novel, Snow Crash from the 1990s from Neil Stevenson, where his hero, hero or non-hero hero, hangs out for a long time in this imaginary place known as the metaverse. That's a word creation, a portmanteau of the meta, which is a supra abstraction, supra abstraction of something of, in this case, of the universe. So it's a meta representation of the universe. So what's the definition of the metaverse? There is none and I have not found none and that's why I won't invent one. The best I could do is I, I looked around and I found 23 definitions for you. And the best I could do is to create a word cloud. So here you have it, that's the definition. But staring at it quite, for quite some time, I was able to extract some common characteristics. So what did I find? Well, first of all, many say it's still somewhat futuristic. So there's all this sci-fi feel to it. It's new, it's the future, it's still early. It's, be, it's just all we know, it's beyond what there is right now. All right. It's a convergence of the digital and the physical world. So this digital twin idea seems to be very important. And the digital twin is the idea that you have these mirror worlds between the digital and the analog reality. It's immersive and generative. And that is probably the biggest one that we can see the biggest difference. So the immersive 3D environment and generative artificial intelligence obviously will play a big role in, in motivating the content of these environments. And it's persistent, and that has to do with the blockchain. We will talk more about that in another lecture, because the blockchain, if you wanna migrate from one metaverse to the other metaverse, for example, you have something there, a digital good, and you wanna transfer it, the blockchain basically makes it interoperable because it has this memory and time, for example, for, for property of having something. So that makes it persistent. The metaverse is not, the blockchain is not required for the metaverse. Same as generative AI is not required for the metaverse. Same as actually 3D must not be required. Just a 2D conference. You be hanging out in the metaverse right now. Welcome. <laughs> so these are just like, there, there are shades of gray there on how to define the metaverse. But I think that's kind of like fits the, the vision. And now the task is to socially construct it together. Technological change is always a story of social construction. 
these visions are very closely related to the evolution of the web in general. The web just basically as a metaphor for the interface between us and the digital reality. And this interface, call it the web, has evolved through different stages too. So we have the web 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and, and, and they can be characterized. Again, this is not a hardcore definition, but I'm gonna talk a little bit here and there in order to get you used to the distinction that in, in different people, if you work in a different company and you switch companies or you work, you talk with different experts or non-experts, they might have a different definition. But I think I want to give you a general feel of what that evolution is about because people drop these terms a lot. The web 2.0, the Web 1.0 was more about passive searching. 2.0 about sharing. It's more social in that aspect. And the 3.0 is more about generating. So generative AI, for example, uh, will be important and of the creation of it. Now, you could also think about it. Web 1.0 was static. 2.0 more dynamic. And 3.0 interactive. There's more interactivity here. And 1.0 was made of pages. 2.0 of applications. Think about social media. Social media, you are at 2.0. And 3.0 is environment. So you can think about virtual reality environments, for example. So that's how you can think about it. Think about a normal web page, 1.0, a social media app, 2.0, and a virtual reality, 3.0. Then you're pretty close to what people are talking about, but they might disagree in the details. So what are some other distinctions? You, you find. Well, 1.0, they will say, was owned more by organizations. You can think about that as basically a newspaper in digital format, basically. Or universities had, had web pages, but that's more like the university bulletin board. Just publish something, what's going on here? And you would, would publish that. And you could read the BBC online, and, and that would be it. So it would be a static page, and the organizations would just publish in digital what they did before in, in analog. That's digitization. Now, the 2.0 took more advantage of digitalization. And here, Facebook is the epitome of the social network, just because it was the first and the biggest social network we've ever created then until date. Two to three out of seven to eight connectable people on planet Earth are actively connected every month through Facebook. And that's a lot. That's a, the biggest social network we ever constructed. And that's a good epitome for, for 2.0. So there are people in there. And 3.0, what's in there? Well, things. So these environments are full of things. They might be artificially intelligent things that have some agency themselves, but it's an internet of things. So that's why they refer to 3.0. And these things can talk to, uh, between each other. Um, they can, one machine can say, hey, I need to be charged. And the second machine starts charging them. And, and they do. If you charge something, for example, like the Internet of Things, you might think about it's you can program when you want your self-driving car to charge. Start charging at 1 a.m. and it will start charging. So that's already an Internet of Things. It's the, the car communicating with the electrical outlet. Not so magic, but that's that's where we're already going into this Internet of Things idea that they talk to each other, these, these machines. You can also think about it, the level of interactivity of immersiveness, actually. So Web 1.0 was more passive reading. 2.0 was social media sharing. Everybody had a web page now it's because Facebook provided a web page for you. So you didn't even have to know HTML. You just, you got your own web page and you could write there. You could write a blog, for example, as well. Blogs are certainly Web 2.0. And then the virtual reality, that would be more immersive 3.0. So you can think about it. So it's passive reading, then there's social interaction, and here it's more immersion into also immersion with things. We might interact with, or we are interacting with intelligent things in, uh, in that web 3.0. Now, who creates the meaning? Another distinction might be who creates the meaning. In web 1.0, it was still pretty much the old paradigm. Meaning was centrally constructed. The Encyclopedia Britannica decided what is it basically the digital publication, the digitization of the Encyclopedia Britannica online. That was that. Now, Wikipedia is very different. It's more like a social media. See, so we socially decide what's the definition of something and what will be Web 3.0. Well, generative AI will, that's, that's at least the vision, will generate things for us. And when we end out and we cannot agree, then we will talk with generative AI because generative AI has read all of our opinions. So large language models have read all of our opinions and they can say, well, actually, like on average, what you, when you say that, that's actually what you guys mean. 
And that's pretty impressive. There's no human brain that has read all of our stuff in, in like all these, whatever, 50 terabytes. Like no human brain has, has read that, what these large language models have read. So the idea is here that meaning then we start to trust these machines, that meaning is uh, AI generated through generative AI. So that's the paradigm shift. Centrally, by authority, by society, by machines that learn from us. And the last distinction um, is the value. So the value in the Web 1.0 was still very traditionally industrial. It was owned by the companies, BBC, Yahoo, AOL, and so forth. Then in Web 2.0, supposedly it was owned by the community. Well, it was also owned by the social media platform providers, the Facebooks and YouTubes of the world. But in theory, the community created the value of that it was actually there. And, and they created it. The community created the value. Maybe didn't own it, but it created it. And so who will create and own the value in Web 3.0? Well, they are the when it comes to value, the battle is still on. That has to be socially constructed. We could say the machine own it by generative AI. Maybe that will turn out to be true. Or the individuals own it because there is a technology that would theoretically allow individuals to take ownership of data, take ownership of their own data and of the information. And that technology is the blockchain technology. And we will talk about that in a different lecture. Now, summing up, as I said, I cannot give you a clear cut definition of, of what that is as, as much as, as we would like that, but you can think about it like this. So the web 1.0 to search static pages, web 2.0, you can think about it to share dynamic apps, and web 3.0, you can think about it to create, to generate interactive environments. Now, the rest is our responsibility to socially construct web 3.0 and everything that comes afterwards, 4.0, 5.0, and so forth.